All right, so in these bumper videos, you're going to be President William Spalding. You're the president of Will You. Right? Okay. All you have to do is read the cue cards that we hold up. I know I haven't shown you. You just read them as we show them to you. Okay. You'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be good. All right, here we go. Take, take one. Hi, I'm William Spalding, president of Will You. Every once in a while, I choke on my own spit. Really? Every once in a while, I choke on my own spit. Do a different one. This is terrible. <laughs> this is awful. At Will You, it's okay to listen to Josh Groban shirtless. <laughs> Hi, I am William Spalling, president of Will You. And brunch just ain't my day. Finger snaps no, with no. attitude. <laughs> it's an you action. Guys are idiots. Okay. And brunch just ain't my day. Not day. What? That's Come on. Right. Just, we just need to be. A little flatter in the front. Oh, that sort of feels nice. Hi, I'm William Spalling, president of Will You. As far as I'm concerned, Betty White, more like Betty, all right! <laughs> no coaching necessary. <laughs> Do we want to make fun of Joel a little bit? Or? At Will You, if you played football in high school, you're not welcome here. Hi. Do like this, go, do, do exercise, go. Meow, 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 meow. No, don't show that. You're an idiot. Go away. Leave me alone. No, I'm not doing that. Hi, I'm William Spalling, president of Will You. Look what I could do. Look what I could do. I don't want to do that. It's dumb. That's not as funny as what you think. At Will You, our hamburgers are made with 100% what? Leprechaun meat. <laughs> That's just not funny. You guys are stretching. At Will You, our hamburgers are made of... <clears throat> just keep going. Read it. We don't pee in the pool at Will You. We pee into the pool. <laughs> keep going. Hi, I'm William Spalling, president of Will You. Believe it or not, I've been diaper free since 2007. <laughs> Hi, I'm William Spalling. Hi, I'm William Spalling, president of Will You. Come to Will You or I'll punch you right in your booger factory. Or I'll punch you right in your booger factory. Or I'll punch you right in your booger factory. <laughs> At Will You, our alien overlords encourage self-expression. Long live Blairnick. I think we ought to make, I think we ought to make, I think you ought to make fun of, uh, oh. Don't look now, but there are chicken nuggets in this plant. <laughs> they smell nasty. I don't know where they're from. They were just in there. Yeah, smell those know. things. They're oh, bad, man. <laughs> That's so <laughs> gross. <laughs> no, I think they're probably okay. We are excited for you to be a part of the Will You Legacy. Please come. Okay, that's not even funny. That's stupid. You know, he's not the president of Will University. Uh, actually, you are. And we're going to talk about what it means to go there and to actually work on willpower because that's what this series is all about. It's about developing self-control, discipline, and willpower so you can accomplish all the things in life that you know you're supposed to and what God wants you to. Um, at one of the great universities, Stanford, um, there was a, an amazing test that took place back here, an amazing like, moment called the Marshmallow Test in, in, in this thing that they did. Now, if you grew up and you went to like a fraternity or whatever, it's not the same test. Okay, whatever that weird thing you did with marshmallows back when you were in college, that's not what this is. Chubby Bunny, that's not what this is. What they did is uh, on, on the campus and some of the professors, they took marshmallows and they tested kids' willpower. They brought them into a room, three-year-olds, uh, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds, and they put a marshmallow in front of the kids. And they said, if you can not eat the one marshmallow, and they showed them the rest of the marshmallows, they said, if you can abstain from eating the one marshmallow for 15 minutes, then you get the whole bag. You get the whole bag. They showed them the whole bag. They showed them the one. They said, if you can abstain for 15 minutes, you get it. And then they left the room. 
and they had three-year-olds and five-year-olds. Uh, some of them decide to take the marshmallow, and some of them decide to wait. And they, they studied this, and they actually went on and followed these students. And when they're 30 and 40 years old, and they found that there was a direct correlation to their life success based upon the willpower that they displayed they had or didn't have in that test. And so it shows you that your ability to overcome stimulus, short-term temptations for long-term rewards, it really matters in terms of your success. In fact, your willpower, your ability to overcome temptation, your ability to overcome certain obstacles is huge. And for us to grow, for us to become who we're supposed to be as followers of Christ, we have to take this head on. Uh, they found that willpower is correlated with positive life, life outcomes, all these studies did, such as better grades, higher self-esteem, lower substance abuse rates, greater financial security, and improved physical and mental health. So willpower matters. Willpower is super important, and we're going to unpack that today. In fact, it's so important that, I mean, there should actually be a school for willpower. Oh, let's create one, Will University, because the tests show that self-control in terms of overall success in life is more important than your IQ. So you guys are going to school every single day, you're studying, you're, you're getting information, and all the studies show that if you don't figure out how to control your will, your will could destroy your life. So we have to unpack, we have to go to Will University, we have to be able to look past the one temptation so that we can get the greater reward. Here's a definition of willpower. The ability to delay gratification, resisting short-term temptations in order to meet long-term goals. Now listen, I want everyone to just buckle in for this series. This is not a series where you come in and Joel inspires you and you're like, oh yeah, I feel so much better. This is a series that says, if you're going to grow, you have to put the work in. If you're going to change, you have to put the work in. Will you go to will you? That's the question. And when you talk about willpower, the ability of self to govern self, there are words that you start to, to kind of see and feel and experience and you might see in movies or see uh, you know, in someone's life or you might see in parts of your life. These are the words associated with willpower. Determination. You're, are you determined? Are you like able to like stick with it and you just stay, you're determined. One of my favorite movies is Rocky IV, okay? Rocky IV, right, where he goes to Russia. If you're a student here, raise your hand if you've seen Rocky IV. Okay, so you guys have seen this amazing movie. You're, you're, that's great. It's good. That scares me. Like, culturally, I would feel like you need to see, like, Ken Burns, The Civil War, and Rocky IV, because they're, like, similar in terms of meaning. But Rocky, he's in there, and he's, like, doing the things with his abs, and his trainer is screaming. You remember this. No pain. No pain. No pain. No pain. No pain. Because what he's saying is, are you determined to overcome this pain in the lower abdomen so that you can beat the Russian? Do you have determination? Do you have willpower? Are you able to look past short-term gratification for long-term success? Another word, drive. Are you driven? When you wake up every single, every single morning, do you have a goal? And are you doing specific things to get to that goal? Or are you doing specific things to keep yourself protected from what might steal that success? Willpower, resolve, a resolve. That means you've made up your mind. That means you're standing firm. That means wherever you're headed, you're saying, I'm going there and nothing is going to shake me. And I'm going to have a wide base and I'm going to gain strength and I'm going to let things come at me. But I'm already ready to overcome them because I've resolved that where I want to go and how I want to get there is so important. And then uh, more clear words, more big, these big ideas, self-discipline. Are you disciplining yourself? Are you actually willing to put yourself into a situation where you train so that you can be successful? And then in other words, self-control. Can you control your impulses? Can you, when, when certain things come to your mind or certain opportunities come, can you identify those things and then steer yourself away from them? You see, this is a series about how 
to gain muscularity and to gain stamina and to gain ability with your willpower. You see, a lot of series that you come to church for, you're learning about where we're going. You know, what is God's will? What, 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 what does he want us to do? What kind of life does he want us to live? We do series all the time about the kind of life God wants us to live. You know, where we're headed. We're supposed to be people who love others. We're supposed to be people who have, you know, different fruits of the spirit of kindness, of gentleness, of forgiveness. You know, of, of, of what we're supposed to do and breathe life into this world around us. But this is not a series about where we're going. Because ultimately, I'm making a little bit of an assumption that everybody in here kind of knows that already. You know you want to do what God wants you to do. You know you want to, like, honor people and, and love people and forgive people. You know the, the direction of a great life. You, you get that, the where. And I'm not saying it's easy. In fact, it, it is simple, but it's so difficult to get to the where, and that's what this series is about. It's about how. How. Oh, we want to have a great life. We want to save enough money to buy that thing. We want to work out every single day so that we can compete at the highest level. We want to, you know, have a great relationship with our spouse and so that it doesn't blow up with other relationships. We want that. Of course, that's what God wants. That's what we want. We say we would. How? Willpower. The ability to overcome the temptations that come at us and will come at us every single day. So that we can stay on track for that where. And it's great. That motivation is important. That direction, that inspiration is important. But this is a series about the nitty gritty, about the disciplines that it takes to get there. And this story, in terms of your will and my will, is an age old story. This, is, this idea of willpower is a human experience. Every person has to develop a level of muscularity to be able to overcome short term temptations. You can actually get better at this. And what I want to show you is that every single person since the beginning of time has needed to get better than this. So if you're already not convinced that short-term temptations can destroy long-term successes, um, let me just take you there a little bit more. The beginning of this story, the human story, in terms of a Christian narrative or a biblical paradigm, starts in this place called Eden where God created this perfect beautiful garden. It's a garden. It's called paradise. So whatever you can think of in paradise, if you think of like, whenever I think of paradise, I think of those things that come up on my Instagram feed of like the little huts over the clear water somewhere. Where are those? Tahiti. I don't, where are those? I'm like that. Now that looks like paradise, right? This is where these people were, except it was in a garden and there was Plenty to eat, more than you can imagine. There was companionship. There was work to be done. There was satisfaction through actually becoming who you were. There was relationships to be built. There were things to eat. There was life to experience to the full. This is the way God wants our lives to be. He actually wants us to experience paradise. He wants us to love one another and care for one another and take care of things and bring life and goodness to all those around us. So that's what he's like, I'm starting you out here. And in Genesis, we see that God wants good things and paradise for us so much that it says he created all of it. He calls it very good by the time the creation is made. And then essentially it says that he picks up Adam and puts him in Eden. This is what I want for you. This is the life I have for you. But what ends up happening is the age-old story of a temptation comes along, and even though they have all that good, they choose the bad. It's amazing. Here's what it says after Adam is put into this garden in Genesis. It says, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will die. Okay, let's just, let's just break this out one by one. Lord God commands Adam. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So let's just take the marshmallow test and, and just flip it. God starts off and says, you get the whole bag. All of it. It's yours. You can eat it. And it's magical. It's a bottomless pit. It will just keep on populating marshmallows. When you take one out and eat it, more will grow. The more you eat, the more you get. You don't need anything else. You have everything you need. Just ask for it and you shall receive. 
I mean, who wants a marshmallow? I mean, who didn't come to church to get thwacked in the side of a face with a big, jut, jet puffed marshmallow? Whoa, that one. No, no. I'm throwing my left hand. I mean, this is just total vulnerability. Ugh. Anybody get that? Oh, you caught that? That's awesome. God says you can have all the marshmallows you want. You, you want one? You want some of these? You guys want, these are amazing. I mean, are you kidding me? Here, here, here. If they touch the floor, it's fine. Are you serious? I mean, they're, they're probably better after they touch the floor, right? So God starts off and he says, you get the whole bag. Hang with me in Genesis chapter 2. Then he comes along and he says, but you must not eat from what? The tree. Get the picture. You get the whole bag. You can't eat from one tree. Think about it. And the one tree is just one of the same of all the things you're allowed to eat. You can have the whole bag of marshmallows, but don't eat the one marshmallow. By the way, this marshmallow, it's the same as the ones you already have a limitless supply of. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. That's my one command. I just want you to know, can you, can you just listen to me? Can you just do what I say? Because if you don't eat it, you get to stay alive and experience paradise forever. If you do eat it, remember the thing we're talking about. It's the thing you already have. Remember the thing we're talking about. It's the thing you already have. You already have many trees. This is one tree. It's like you have 100 apple trees and God pulled one apple off of those trees and said you can eat all those. You already have those. This is the same thing. Don't eat that or you lose everything. And actually it's worse than that. He doesn't just say if you eat the one, you'll lose the one. He doesn't even say you'll lose the bag. He says you will die. That's dramatic. <laughs> You're going to die. I already gave you everything you need. Don't take the one thing you don't need that you already have because when you do it, not only will you lose all of those things, you will lose a relationship with God. You will lose a relationship with people. You will lose a relationship with your body. You will lose a relationship with earth. Destruction, devastation will enter into the world because you ate the one thing you already had. And everyone knows the way the story goes. They come along. They see the one marshmallow, God walks away, and they pick it. They say, man, that looks good. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel happy. I'm going to eat that. They eat it, and then they die. And when we talk about our will and our, our, our deficiencies in our will, it, it's, it's one thing to kind of unpack will in terms of humans, but the whole nature of will started with God because God is perfect and God has a perfect will. You think about God's will, right? That's what we talk about a lot. God's will, what he wants, what he says, what he thinks. So because we're created in the image of God, a God of will with perfect will, he decided to make us as little versions of himself. We, we, we carry his image. And so what he did is he gave us a version of will. But it was a free will. Because God is loving and good and that's his nature and that's just who he is and he's outside of us. And, you know, who has really understood God? No one. We don't understand him fully. But he made us with a version of himself or a version of will and it's free. And the reason he gave us a free will is he wanted to have a real relationship where love takes place volitionally or willfully. So he says, here's, here's the proof. You pick what I say and that means you love me and you pick what I don't say to do. You're choosing not to love me. That's freedom. So in your will, the way that God gave it to you, you had options to love God or not. And every single one of us, as crazy as it may seem, and if you're honest with yourself, you can view this like if you were watching a movie, because if you were watching a movie and someone did this test or you were watching a little kid take the test and they did it even opposite, they said, you already have this and you don't need anything else. Don't eat this. If you get it, you know you would take the smaller one and you know that they do. And we know that when we get into the story, we get muddled and foggy and we make the wrong choice. Because a lot of us are sitting in this room today as a result of doing the one thing or the some things that we know were short-term uh, gratifications, and they've caused great repercussions. And so your will, it sits in your life, 
your desires, your impulses, it sits there and God gave it to you and now it's broken. So it already had the freedom not to choose and now it's even broken and sinful and it moves and it's twisted. And so we need strength. We need to grow in our will. We need to govern our will. We need to tell it what to do as opposed to let us tell it what to do. So your will is broken now and it's living in you and it can ill and kill your life. I mean, you know this, right? Like you know some people, maybe you're sitting in this room And you made a short-term decision, right? Short-term decision. One of of the things as a pastor that I experience all the time is people call me with every drama under the sun, right? Divorce, drugs, I mean, you'd be surprised. Just the foul play, greed, every single thing comes to me. And when it comes to me, people ask me to fix it. And I sit there and I listen to the problem. And what I'm listening to is the culmination. The culmination of a bunch of decisions that came from someone's inability to govern themselves. And as a pastor, I don't view my job is to go, well, just stop doing that. Just stop. In fact, I say all the time as a pastor, my job, I don't tell people what to do. Some of that was refreshing for me because I grew up where it was like the pastor was always telling people people what to do. I I don't tell people what to do. People call me, they're in the truck, tell us what to do, fix the problem, da 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 And I'm going, dude, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what to do. I can tell you what I think you should do. I can tell you what God wants you to do. But man, the best version of you is going to be when you figure out that you have this thing in you that is continually and daily driving your life and leading to destruction. And so, well, I'm not going to answer you on the phone and tell you what to do in the moment. I'm telling you what to do in this series. Back up now. Get in front of this now. Govern your will now because it can lead to that crisis, and it will if you don't govern it. Because God wants you to have a full life. God wants you to have a thrilling life, and if you start to govern it, it can. You see, the thing about your will, now that it's even broken, it was free, and now it's twisted, is that it thinks it knows what it's doing. Doesn't it? Food, sex, drugs, relationships, money, those things feel, taste, seem so good. The will wants a great life. It smells it and goes, oh, I want to move towards that. It sees it and goes, oh, that must be right. You have to, as a follower of Christ, understand that maybe your will is broken and it's moving towards things that on the, from the outside looking in are like, dude, that's destructive. You can't take that on that way. you got to back up. So your will is broken and it has these desires that are twisted. But the reality is, is that God knows what's right. So the Christian journey is about us surrendering our will to God's will and saying, I'm going to steer and govern my life. I'm going to govern it so that I do what God wants and I experience the goodness that he has. You see, the will, when you start to look at it clearly, it wants three things. And you can break down all of your desires, both good and bad, into this. Will wants to eat. You see, you want to eat. Now, we know, right, eating is okay. A certain amount of eating is good. Will wants to eat. But if you let it eat all the time, you're in trouble. And if you don't feed it, you're in trouble. So you have to figure out a way to back down or speed up. And it's in quotes because it's just this idea that we want to experience pleasure. We want to experience satisfaction in the flesh. Sex. Sex is good. It's, it's designed by God. Out of context, bad. Bad relationships, bad dynamics, bad interactions, bad fallout, bad. God's way, good. So if you let your will drive, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Some of us are in here today because our will said that seems good, and then we went there and we couldn't stop. And that's what sin does. It takes us further than we want to go and keeps us longer than we want to stay. And it's all because the will couldn't govern itself. So will wants to eat. God knows what you should eat and shouldn't eat. So we have to 
train our will to map out and be on page with God's. Will wants to matter. Will wants to feel a sense of self. You have a job. You want to feel valuable. You have a relationship. You want to feel valuable. What happens is will, ungoverned, turns that into pride. It finds reasons to be right. It finds reasons to belittle other people, to pop itself up. And it starts to, when it's ungoverned, just get completely out of control. Just completely frustrated and broken and confused. Because you want pride or you're depressed and anxious because you don't think you matter. And I'm not talking about clinical depression. That's, that's a real, like, injury in a sense or just a brokenness intrinsic. I'm talking about people that just are, like, so depressed because they don't think they matter and they just don't know the truth and their will has gotten the best of them. Your will wants to matter. God knows you matter. God wants to show you that you matter. God wants to give you a sense of self and purpose. But he doesn't want your will to go find it through pride and arrogance. Your will wants to worship. You see, everybody in here, you, you know, when we talk about worship, we talk about worshiping God. And in church sometimes, if you're not a church person and you see someone worshiping God, like with their hands, raise your hand, be honest. Let's have an honest moment. Everybody wake up. Raise your hand, and if you grew up in the Pentecostal church, you're disqualified from this question. Okay, raise your hand if when you came to church one time, you saw people raising your, their hands in worship and it made you uncomfortable. I'm raising my hand. Look at that. All of us. You know why? Because we struggle with worshiping God. We don't struggle with worship. We actually celebrate people who raise their hands for anything but God. When people are really into a workout routine, it's like, you do you, bro. Go. When people are, you know, doing a diet or when people love their work or when people are, you know, even doing a great cause like a fundraiser and they're passionate about it, we go, that's awesome. When people get their new iPhone 10 and they post about it on Instagram and annoy everybody, we go, dude, that's cool. They're worshiping it. We don't struggle with worship. We struggle with people worshiping God. You are designed to worship and your will will eat up things to worship. You will find something to give your life to. You will find something to just divulge in. And when you start to worship the creation and not the creator, it's the beginning of a bad path. Because it will never feed you back. It will never fill you up. It will never give you what God wants. Will wants a great life. God knows a great life. And he wants you to Train your will to worship him. For me, worshiping God on a Sunday morning is something I make myself do. Because I'm like, no, man, if I don't worship this, I'm going to worship something else. I need to worship God. I need to open my mouth with praise. I need to lift my hands and thank him. Because otherwise I'll do it, with someone else. I'll do it, with, do it to something else. Look at this. You and I, we have no problem giving our life to Jesus for salvation. Why can't we give our lives to Christ for everyday life. Look what C.S. Lewis says. He says, to have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if he would not take, if you would not take his advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you are trying to obey him. You see, you and I, we're, we're jacked up about Jesus dying on the cross and giving us eternal life and a pathway to heaven. Are we just as jacked up about his ability and his desire for us to surrender our will to his every single day? Oh, Jesus, you can take care of my greatest problem, but I'll take care of my everyday problems. Oh, Jesus, you can save me for eternity, but I'll save myself today. You see, all of us have to go, man, my soul is in God's hand. I've given him my soul, so I'm going to give him my life, and I'm going to give him my will, and I'm going to follow him every single day, and I'm going to let him train me and lead me, and I'm going to have him quicken me and give me awareness of what could destroy my life. You see, every single one of us in here need will university. Like, I, it's a funny way of saying, like, we have to make the decision to train our will. One of the reasons that I did this series is because in this way, I never learned this. No one ever sat me down and said, let's have a nuanced conversation about your impulses, Joel. No, you know what? My success in life is scary. It's scary in a lot of ways. You know why? 
because for some weird reason, this is my story, not yours, God genuinely got a hold of me, and genuinely I was passionate, willfully chasing after God. So I just went after it. I just, and I would say maybe it wasn't willful. It was just, I'm going after that thing. It hasn't been for the last seven years that I've realized, whoa, there's a lot of things out there that could take me off this path. I need to figure out how to govern myself, my emotions, my impulses, the words that I speak. Because if I don't, I'm in trouble. So we all have to say, like, I've got to figure out some of these potential potholes in my life. Here's what this is. Will University is gaining. It's for gaining self-control to reach your long-term goals. You have to gain self-control. You have to build self-control. If you don't make a decision today to go through some training, to go through some identifying, to go through some kind of eye-opening experiences, to bring other people in, to actually work and go to Will University, then what will happen is you will learn all of these things the hard way in this place called the School of Hard Knocks. And some people go to the School of Hard Knocks where temptations come their way, they don't resist them, and then they end up in jail, if you will. They end up sidetracked, they end up sidelined, they end up broke down, they end up addicted to drugs, broken relationships, failed businesses, all of it. You may hear this and go, this is just a self-help talk. Do you understand that God has called us to walk in a manner worthy of what he's called us. That means we have to be fighters and vigilant and workers and push. We have to go for this Christian life. We have to go for it. Anybody know someone who has phenomenal willpower? Just people that just, they just get this. They just, they just understand it. Uh, a great story about someone who with great willpower is about Tyler Joseph, the lead singer of 21 Pilots. Now, he started in our church as a worship leader, and then, like, we actually made him famous. He didn't do anything. We did. And then he, we, you know, he, he's lucky for being here. You're welcome, Tyler. I hope you're watching. You're not. You're asleep. Okay. So, but <laughs> Tyler's story is amazing because he had this immense willpower. He had this vision for his journey. And he would never, ever let something take him off of that path with 21 Pilots, even to the point of being stubborn. And there, there's another commentary on that. But he had strong willpower to do what he thought his long-term goals were. Before he actually left the church, uh, he was on staff for a little bit, we had this conversation about how um, if, you know, Billy Joel or if, um, you know, certain Sting called him up and said, hey, man, I've heard your music. I heard your music, bro. I'm not going to do an accent. I heard your music, and I want you to come and sing with me, like, at the Oscars. He told me, he said, I wouldn't do it. And you can imagine, I got in this argument. I'm like, what? That's stupid. Like, you, if Sting calls you, you got to put on the red light, man. Like, you got to go. Like, you should do that. And he was like, I won't. And I was like, why? And he's like, because I don't want you know, to be associated with Sting. I want 21 Pilots to be its own. He said, click. And I was like, well, that's stupid because that could be your secret to success. You should take that train, man. And he wouldn't do it. Then, years later, before they got really big, he played a show in town and Taylor Swift was in town. Anybody heard of Taylor Swift? Anyway, uh, she, she's a big country fan, a music artist, and now she's pop. She at the time, was inviting up-and-coming acts to come and do a song or two during her show. And she was in town playing at the shot the same night that Tyler was playing in town. And afterwards, she realized that they were up-and-coming so fast that she felt bad that she didn't invite them to the show. So they went to Missouri when they were playing in the same town again, and Taylor Swift reached out to Tyler and said, will you come and play at my show? And Tyler said, no, no, he told me this later, and I was like, same reaction, what, what are you doing, like, that could have given you a whole new level of exposure, and you could, like, be big, and actually really get there, I mean, it's Taylor Swift, and he was like, yeah, but I don't want to be associated with some, like, teeny bopper girl who just looks into the wind, I, I don't know, he just said something, and I was just like, you're, you're crazy, all so that he could, now, do you guys know what all of his resolve all of his self-discipline, all of his willpower is done. 
Blurry Face just became what? The only record of all time or fastest of all time to have every song on it go gold or platinum. What? And he believed that tainting his image, that's willpower. That's this ability to say no. That's this ability to say yes to the future. So Paul in the New Testament, hard turn left. Paul in the New Testament, he tells Christians in Corinth about willpower. He teaches them. He uses warnings from Israel's history to say, you guys, if you don't stand firm, if you don't gain self-control, you are going to fall into traps that many, many people for thousands of years have fallen into. And he does it, he does it in such a way, it's just this great passage. I want you to look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says this, he says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If, if you think you're standing firm, he says, to the Christians, in court, if you think that you are not susceptible to temptation, you're in trouble. Now, students, when you hear me talk about temptation, everyone in the room is thinking, these are the guys that need to figure this out, right? Because, like, your life is, you're young, and you have a lot in front of you, and temptation could kind of hurt you in a such a way and veer you off the past, right? right? Everybody get that if you're in high school, not... Yeah, right? I can't go that way. I don't want to do that. This verse is not for you. It's for everybody else that thinks that they don't need help, that thinks that they're not susceptible, that thinks that they've made it down the road far enough, that thinks that they don't have a problem with temptation because you don't have some overt problem. You just have a covert problem that you haven't identified. It's something about just the way you respond. It's your impulses. It's envy. It's, it's, uh, it's a lack of trust, it's seediness, something going on in you, the way you respond, the words that you choose. Your impulses still have the ability, because they're ungoverned, to destroy your life. And so he's saying, like, you need to, every person that reads this, you need to humble yourself and go, I know I have areas of weakness. I know that I have blind spots. I know that there's something in my impulses that I could at one point turn to and therefore turn away from what God has. Because if you don't, you will fall. He's saying many people have gone down this road. Many people that are just like you have fallen. And he goes on, he says this, to kind of confirm and tie this thought. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common. Common. You see, temptation is common. It's something that has started from the beginning and the first people failed miserably worse than even kids in the marshmallow test. They had everything, and they chose one thing, and they lost everything. So temptation is common. We're all going through the same experiences. We all have different impulses. They don't all look the same. We don't all have the same ones that get the best of us, but all of us have some that can get the best of us. It's common. It's normal. You see, what's not common is people fighting against them. Temptation is common, but resistance, intentional resistance to temptation. Taking responsibility and going, I'm going to fight this. That's the enemy. That's a problem. That could sideline me. I'm going after that. That is very uncommon. You see, one of the things about this, this temptation phenomenon that a lot of us have experienced and are experiencing and will experience, and for the rest of our lives we will, is there's a couple things we say about it that are not true, that are lies. The first one is we say, my temptation is unique. You see, the power of temptation is so strong that it feels like it was tailor-made for you. And then it does this thing where it, it moves into your world and says, you know, you can't win them all. You can't win. You, you, this is too much. This is, this is just my thing. I just, I'm never going to, I'm not going to do this. And you think that that temptation, no one else is going through that. And then that's kind of the, the lead into the second lie. The second lie is that we think that no one else is going through what we're going through. And we think that anyone that's not fallen into temptation, we think, oh, they're just not tempted. Because if they were tempted like me, they would fall. We think if someone is really living this life of temperance and of steadfast and they've got it all together, we think, well, I mean, they didn't have my problems. They don't have my problems. So we start to lie and trick ourselves into thinking why we don't need any help. And then that's what Paul is saying. Be careful because you're going to fall if you don't understand you actually need help. You see, the idea of us looking at people who aren't 
falling and thinking that they're weak is a complete lie, and the opposite is actually true. It's probably more accurate that people who are living strongly, who are overcoming temptation, they're the ones that feel more temptation than anyone else. But what's the difference? Somewhere along the way, they gain strength. Somewhere along the way, they have muscularity because the temptations are common. They're coming at them the same, but they're marching. So they figured it out. Some of them just have some natural ability to figure it out, and some of them have been trained to figure it out, and some of them have overcome the school of hard knocks to move on and do things better. The point is, is that we're all going through this, and if we all don't take responsibility for it, we can all fall. But here's the good news, and this is what Paul says. He says, God is faithful, and he wants you to be successful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what who, what you can bear. The great news in all this is that if you're a follower of Christ, that you as a follower of Christ, you have the strength, you have this ability, we're going to talk about it over the next couple weeks, to overcome, to endure. And he says that, he says, as a follower, you will not be tempted, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure. He's going to provide a way. He's going to do that for you. He's going to move in that, 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 that way in your life. And I believe with all of my heart that understanding this is the way. He's like, I'm providing you. I'm giving you this insight. I'm showing you you need to stand firm. I'm showing you you need to gain muscularity. I'm showing you that you can get through this with me and experience those long-term success. Here's what I ask you in terms of Will University. I mean, I look like, I know you don't come to church and you're, you're thinking like, man, will you give me a project, Joel? But I'm going to give you a project. That's what we're going to do. Like, you're going to grow, and you're going to work, and you're going to be less than inspired, and you're going to perspire. I mean, anybody willing to work to have a better relationship with God and a better relationship with the world? I mean, that's what this is. So here's some questions for you. Will you define your long-term goals? Will you just take a minute and write them down? And it's, it's almost silly. It's so obvious. Um. But I want you to articulate them. What do you want to do? Job, marriage, money, relationships, serve, give your life away, be a missionary, whatever. What is your long-term goal? What do you want to see happen in 10 years? What, 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 what gets you excited? What, what are you inspired by? Sports, whatever, academics, whatever it is, what do you want to do? And then I want, I want you to actually write those down. And then I want you to identify the greatest threats to those things. Your greatest threats in you. The things that could sideline you. Be honest. Start to take this, this moment seriously and go, okay, now I want to get somewhere. And my, man, this could lead me and I could fall and I don't want to. What are those things that have a root in you, that have a hook in you, that you know if those things grow, they could go really bad? Write them down. And if you can't think of anybody, anything, just ask the person next to you or your closest friend. They'll give you five. They're like, dude, your mouth, that's number one, your mouth. You know, what, I mean, they'll just go give it to you. And you need to listen. And then would you make a commitment to engage in some resistance training? Like, I'm going to ask you to do some things that are difficult. I'm going to challenge you to do some things that, that are maybe uncomfortable so that you can gain some resistance. Here's the thing that's cool about the marshmallow test. They found that you can gain muscularity to overcome temptation. They found that there were certain things that you could do to resist. They actually studied and saw that kids, this is so simple, but it's beautiful, the kids who didn't look at the marshmallow, were able to overcome the temptation. Some kids sat there for 15 minutes and looked at the marshmallow and then they ate it. Some kids just decided not to look at it. Out of sight, out of mind. Would you be willing to like do some things that could help you gain success? Would you be willing to go on this journey with the rest of us? Let's